I um, was talking to a woman uh, a week or so ago, and she's an upper management executive, um, married 20 years, has two kids. And you know, she was talking about how unhappy she has become in her career and in her job, that she feels irrelevant, although she's still paid quite a bit of money. Um, the job itself has been structured around her, which sounded pretty good to me. But she was um, talking to me about this because she's truly unhappy and, and really feels like she needs a change in her life. So I began to ask her a few more questions. And I say, well, how's your marriage? And she said, oh, you know, we've been married 20 years. And, you know, it's good. I mean, we take care of each other. And we're kind of like roommates. And I said, well, how's your sex life? She said, oh, we haven't had sex in probably a year. We don't do that anymore. And I said, well, what do you do for fun? And she says, fun, question mark? Well, at this point, I look at her, and I just wait. And we stare at each other. And she says what I was hoping that she would say. She said, ah. Oh. She goes, I guess I'm not just unhappy in my career. I guess I'm just unhappy. Aha! And I say, yeah, you know, something happens to us when we um, stop being engaged in the present moment, when we stop really being engaged in our lives. This sort of general malaise penetrates the rest of our lives. And then you're not unusual and you're not alone. This is something that happens to a lot of people. And I said, the good news is this that happiness is not a pursuit, but it is a perspective. I love the saying that the grass isn't always greener on the other side of the fence. It's greener where you water it. Now I heard today that there's an Australian saying that's similar. <laughs> that the grass is greener on the other side of the fence, but it's harder to mow. So my late, my late husband, Dr. Richard Carlson, and I have made a business out of innovating lives and bringing insight that is applied to life in a really beautiful way that changes lives. But it is your typical overnight success story. It took 10 years. Richard wrote many, many books. Um, you can be happy no matter what. You can feel good again. Shortcut through therapy. And then on his 10th book, he did something incredibly innovative. He changed the format of his writing. And he perfected that seven to 800 word essay. He knew what was trending was that people were really busy, that we all thought like, all this technology, email, and cell phones would give us more time. Well, how many of you in the audience feel like you have more time because of technology, right? Well, he saw that in our lives. He saw that in his own life. And he said, I need to find a way to reach the end, the reader, say the same thing, but say it in a way that are bite-sized little bits, right? And the beauty of that is now our books reside in bathrooms or the loo. <laughs> no, but really, um, it was just incredible that he developed that form of writing because it really resonated um, with, his, with his public. The second thing that he did was we were really one of the first branding authors where we took different topics and different groups of people, and we applied the same format, the same insight. Um, but we, we sort of niche marketed our books like Chicken Soup for the Soul did. Um, and that was incredibly innovative at the time. The third thing that he did that was really innovative was that he invited me, his wife, into the series when we wrote Don't Sweat the Small Stuff in Love together. 
Now, I became the feminine voice of the series, and that was pretty smart, right? Because that made the series very well-rounded. And I didn't do that without a little bit of reticence, because I wasn't the psychologist, and he was, and, you know, and I, I just wasn't sure how that was going to be perceived, but it was perceived well. And it was really wise on his part. Now, fast forward 10 years, and you know we're standing in the kitchen. And he says to me, um, Chris, you know what's really cool is the 10th anniversary book has come out. And we're looking at this book, and it's the culmination of all the Don't Sweat the Small Stuff books, the best chapters. And he said, you know what's really awesome is that in 10 years, every 10 years, there's a whole new group of people that our books will reach, right? Now, I've had a lot of time to think about why our book series did what it did globally, right? Like, you would expect it perhaps to happen in America, but then to happen in Japan and all over the world was really astounding. And after talking to different branding specialists and really thinking about it. There's really five things that I want to share with you about our series that I think really has made it um, different and set itself apart from, from other brands and why it went so global. And the first thing is the genius of its simplicity, that the bite-sized chapters, those small chapters, and the way they were written, the clarity with which they were written, just to have one big idea for people. But not only one big idea, it was like, how do you practice this idea? And how do you make it practical and super valuable to people, right? So there's an art to that. The second thing was that we delivered valuable content that was authentic. It was relatable. And it really transcended so many different normal social barriers because of its relatability. The third thing is that the series, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, and I mean, I have a little bone to pick with Richard about, and it's all small stuff. <laughs> it was a big title, right? And then the subtitle had a big promise, how not to let the little things take over your life. The fourth thing was that it invoked people, because of the impact of the work, it invoked people to go out and tell other people about it. So we somehow tapped into the most amazing sales force in the entire world, and that is word of mouth. Not only did people buy it for themselves, but mostly actually people don't buy this book for themselves. <laughs> mostly they buy it for other people. A quick little story. Um, we were at Costco. Do you know what Costco is? OK. You have them here? OK. So we were at Costco, um, and we were in line. And somebody rolled up with their cart, and it was a guy. And he had about, I'm not kidding you, 10 copies of Don't Sweat the Small Stuff in his cart. And I'm standing with Richard. Now, Richard was a tall man at 6'4", but he was no tall poppy. <laughs> He was standing next to me, and he looks at me and gives me this warning look. Like, don't you dare say anything. Because <laughs> I look down. and So I, I nudge the guy, and I go, guy, it looks like you really like that book. He goes, oh, I love this book. Oh my god, I love this book. I buy it for everyone I know. Richard is just, just literally like starting to go. <laughs> I'm like, well, how would you like the author to sign him for you? And Richard's just like, so anyways, that was our story. And, and, and that, that's the kind of advertising that you, know, you, you, just, you don't even know how that happens. But I believe that it happened because the book was so impactful. The last thing I'd like to say is that you know, there was some, a little bit of media savvy that you know, both Richard and I have. And that helped a lot because there was a time when he was interviewed all over the world, like just constantly. And being able to um, jump into the brand the way I was, I also had to be able to carry that forward. I had to be able to stand on my own two feet in an interview situation. I don't know if you heard the ABC 
radio interview today. Did, you, did anybody hear it? Well, I'm glad because I got thrown some really interesting questions <laughs> in the beginning. And at, at some point I had to say, um, I think we should invite Monica Bradley in here. <laughs> I think it was the subtitle of the of the whole event, you know, and and I, and I was just eventually I was like, you yeah, know, I don't, I'm not an expert in that area. But Richard was an amazing interviewer, and one time his second trip to Oprah, he was sitting in the green room, and Oprah walks by and she leans in and she says, "Hey, Richard, I just got to tell you, you know," he jumps up, he hugs her, he's like, "I just got to tell you how much I love your book." Um, thank you so much for teaching me the art of presence. And then she said, and you know what? I love it so much I keep it next to my bedside. And Richard says, will you say that on the air, Oprah? <laughs> and she says, oh, you don't need me to do that. Oprah, say it on the air. Please say it on the air. Sure enough, she looks at him and smiles and says it on the air. And that's when um, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff rose to the top of the New York Times to the number one spot and stayed there for over 150 weeks in that position. So around the 10th anniversary, you know, again, um, we were super excited. You know, that's like a pinnacle, a kind of a pinnacle point for a book and, and a pinnacle year. But we had no idea that um, a few days after Richard and I had that conversation in our kitchen, that our lives would change forever. Just about three days later, he got on a flight to New York, and it was a normal business trip, a normal, you know, normal time for us. But he didn't get off of that plane. He died on the descent of that flight. And he died from a pulmonary embolism. So that really catapulted me and my girls. I have two daughters. They were 14 and 17 at the time. That catapulted us into a pivot turn in life that we did not plan on at all. Not at all. And there's a lot of things that I could share with you tonight about the innovation that I had to go through in my life um, to reinvent my life about all of the insights that were just tremendous in that year, two years, three years of incredible grief that we all went through together as a family. But the one thing and the one great gift, you know, they always say there's a message in the mess, and the one great gift to me personally was that Richard had taught Oprah the art of presence. He had taught the world how to be more present in their lives and how to be more engaged. And I wasn't feeling that way just before he died. I was feeling passionless, and I was feeling like questioning. I, I think I was kind of in what might be called a midlife crisis time, although now that I've been through a crisis, I certainly don't think of it as a crisis. <laughs> I was in an inquiry time, you know, what, what, what am I going to do with my life? My kids are growing up. Um, you know, you, you, you reach a level of success and sometimes because of the things that used to drive you when you're younger, you, they don't drive you the same way anymore. So I wasn't really sure, you know, what direction my life was going to take at that time. And I wasn't living very presently either. But the gift that I was given and grief was to live presently. Why? Because presence and being in the moment wouldn't fail me. Presence is a state of mind, and it's an experience, and it broadens all of your possibilities to live presently. Your connection to other people grows exponentially when you're present. Your connection to all that matters to you is obvious in the present moment. And you know, when I had practiced meditation, and I thought I knew, but you know, people would say, 
do you feel that tree? And I'd be like, I don't feel that tree. <laughs> you know, but that year and to this day, you know, I never miss when I look outside and I see the sky. And to me, I think the sky, nature, everything, there's so much beauty around us. There's so much beauty in a smile. When you walk by and you just smile at somebody and they smile back, and I notice these things now, and I didn't notice them before. I'm so much more present with my grandchildren. Today I have three grandchildren, and I play in the park with them, and I, I, I practically cry when I look at them. I'm so present with them. Now, there's a lot of science now, and I'm going to cite some research just to talk to you a little bit about presence, because the science shows that there's, a, there's some Harvard scientists that did this study, and, and they show that people, in general, are only present 50% of the time. And that means that we're thinking about something else while we're doing something, right? Have you ever like driven your car and then suddenly gotten someplace and you wondered how you got there? Yeah. Right, well, our, well that's how what we're doing in our lives for most of the time. We're driving our car and we're wondering how we're getting places, right? Because we're not being very present in our lives. We want to be engaged. And if you're going to talk about profitability in companies, you want to engage as you want your employees to be engaged, don't you? Well, it's like a huge problem right now. A really good friend of mine, Karen Salmonson, calls it presenteeism. <laughs> She's a wordsmith, a really innovative uh, woman, actually, it's amazing. Um, she calls it presenteeism because people aren't engaged. And do you know when people really are engaged? Can you guess? When they're having sex. <laughs> you know, that's because they're not going to reach over and say, oh, I'm going to grab that text. <laughs> you know, hopefully they would be texting the person they're with, right? <laughs> so what would it be like if we could bring that level of engagement to every connection that we have? Well, maybe not that level. <laughs> Orgasmic! <laughs> Right, no. But really think about that. Like, if, if, if you could be present and be super connected, what do you think that would do to your life? How do you think that would innovate your life? I know that it would innovate your life because it certainly innovated mine. Now, I'm going to um, close tonight by reading a poem to you, and it, it's actually printed in... One of our books, An Hour to Live, An Hour to Love, The True Story of the Best Gift Ever Given. And my hope is that this poem touches your heart in a way that it reminds you to be present every day with the people that you love, that every single day that you have the opportunity to say goodbye, that you have the opportunity to say I love you, do it. Don't wait. So this was Richard's favorite poem. He left it all over our house before he died. It's called Tomorrow Never Comes by Norma Cornett Merrick. If I knew it would be the last time that I'd see you fall asleep, I would tuck you in more tightly and pray the Lord your soul to keep. If I knew it would be the last time that I'd see you walk out the door, I would give you a hug and a kiss, and I'd call you back for just one more. If I knew it would be the last time I'd hear your voice lifted up in praise, I would tape each word and action and play them back throughout my days. If I knew it would be the last time I would spare an extra minute or two, to stop and say, I love you, instead of assuming you know I do. So just in case tomorrow never comes and today is all I get, I'd like to say how much I love you, and I hope we will never forget.
Tomorrow is not promised to anyone, young or old or alike. And today may be the last chance you get to hold your loved one tight. So if you're waiting for tomorrow, why not do it today? For if tomorrow never comes, you'll surely regret the day. That you didn't take that extra time for a smile, a hug, or a kiss, and you were too busy to grant someone what turned out to be their last wish. So hold your loved ones close today and whisper in their ear that you love them very much and you'll always hold them dear. Take time to say, I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you, or it's okay. And if tomorrow never comes, you'll have no regrets about today. So don't sweat the small stuff. <laughs> So we have, uh, oh, you want to go? Oh, yeah. Are they for me? <laughs> so, um, Christine, we'd like to thank you so much for gracing us with your presence. Um, yeah. Yeah. Apart from a very uh, small presentation that... Uh, uh, Christine will do in Sydney at the Happiness Show next week. This is her only appearance and it's here at QUT and it's with you. And I hope it took your heart away the same it did mine and it's really, it's beautiful words from everyone tonight. So the second message I have is that um, I think you're extraordinary and thank you so much for taking Brisbane into your heart and we take you into our heart. If we can help you ever, please. We'd love to not sweat the small stuff more. <laughs> it makes our city great. And I'd like to also welcome the beautiful local talent that we have here and, and next year that, you know, we have a new crop of wonderful people that have come from our audience tonight. So put our hands together for everyone tonight.